Thank you for listening to the Damage Report podcast, the show covering the true threats facing our country and what you can actually do about them. You can support this free podcast by leaving us a review and giving us a five star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you happen to be listening to it. Every review helps more people discover the show at no cost to you. Welcome back to the show, everyone. This is The Damage Word. I am John Adarola. It is Wednesday, and so JR Jackson is in studio. He is JR rated. It's right JR Wednesday. Right JR, you know what? Um, it's, it, was, it was slight uh, JR Tuesday at the end. Mm-hmm. I know you guys saw it because you all watched so religiously this guy. Mm-hmm. And, but now it's officially JR Wednesday. It's time we're to here. talk about depressing things. Uh, hopefully, try not mm-hmm. to get upset. Uh, yeah, no, we're going to try to have a little bit of fun. I mean, we're going to be starting off talking about the big breaking news of the morning oh, is that um, they're bombing everybody up in here. Uh, so we're going to be talking about that. I laugh, but of course, incredibly serious. Uh, we're going to be moving on to, I guess, the little bit of fun that we're going to have today is uh, the White House decided to take down Medicare for all. <laughs> And they took down themselves <laughs> because they're too stupid and know what argument they're actually making. So uh, they actually made the case for Medicare for all in attempting to destroy it. We'll tell you how that actually played out. Uh, we've got some racist ads. You know, we want to update you on the midterms. Um, we've got two interviews, by the way. So congressional candidate, candidate uh, Mallory, Ma- Mallory Hagan is going to be joining us. Uh, she is one of the candidates being affected uh, very obviously by attempted voter suppression. So we're going to be breaking down how that actually works with her a little bit later on. And uh, later on the show, uh, an author and researcher, uh, Daniel Yudkin, is going to be joining us. So we have this idea that America is split between liberals, conservatives, and independents or whatever. Um, But he has done an amazing amount of research showing that there's actually more tribes than just that. And so we're going to be talking about why that is and uh, how we can attempt to bridge these new divides that we didn't even know were there. And then uh, we're going to close the show actually with uh, a new myth of American politics. Very surprising uh, data we were able to find. So uh, you want to jump into it? I'm down, let's go. Okay, let's do it. A series of suspicious packages has been sent to literally every Democrat and member of the media in the country (laughs) effectively. I say that just in case you watch this later on the day because we're finding out about new bombs coming out pretty much every five to 10 minutes at this point. Uh, On yesterday's show, we told you about George Soros, the uh, occasional Democratic donor and uh, locus point of every conspiracy theory on the right that exists. But today uh, we have the Clintons, uh, Barack Obama, uh, as well, uh, so they're targeting obviously very high profile Democratic politicians, but not just that, the media as well. So both CNN and uh, it is believed as well, the San Diego Union Tribune have both had suspicious packages sent to them. So obviously CNN, just about as high profile <coughs> as media gets in this country, they have had to evacuate their building and they're currently doing their live reporting from the street. Yeah. That is the state that we're in. Uh, we're gonna be talking about all this breaking down the individuals, but I, I just wanna give you full updates. In addition to that, we later found out Debbie Wasserman Schultz, former head of the DNC, she was the target of a bomb. And as well, Eric Holder has received a suspicious suspicious package. So some very high profile people continually in the news, some like Debbie Wasserman Schultz hasn't really been talked about in more than a year really, (coughs) but still was a target of a bomb. So as you've been seeing this news roll in, JR, what do you think? Well, actually, no, you mentioned the Eric Holder part, and then as I was driving, I also heard about Debbie Wasserman Schultz. And I was thinking how this is just going to continue to extend, because there was it seemed like a, a broad, uh, I guess, net of the, you, you cast your net wide. You know, mm-hmm. you throw all, this, all these different uh, suspicious and, partic- and possibly dangerous packages to all these folks to make a statement. So I was, uh, a lot of the details that came in were talking about how it was sent through the Postal Service. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a return address on it. They yeah. were crudely packaged. So all these things that would uh, raise a lot of red flags. And if you actually want something to come and, and, and harm someone, you probably want to do it a lot more discreetly, mm-hmm. right? So it seemed that they wanted these to be found. It seemed they wanted these to make news. It seemed they wanted these to be um, on the alert of everyone. So that everyone goes, hey, you just might get something too. Mm-hmm. It's, the, it's the epitome of terrorism um, you know, with, without having to say, well, you know, I didn't hurt anybody. You know, so I, this was my perception. I was like, so they're out to try and scare folks. They want people to not be able to continue to do their job or to be worried about the things they say. Um, 
without having to take on the consequence of actually putting together something like this. Yeah. I mean, you know that, the, without mentioning the Postal Service, they have the most, uh, the most secure way of, of handling packages and, and scanning and bombs. making sure something's not happening. It was pretty obvious these weren't gonna make it through that system. Yeah, although we should note that as in the case with the Soros bombing, uh, I believe, uh, another one was confirmed that it did actually include explosive mm -hmm. materials. So these are not yeah. just things that are meant to look like bombs. So yeah. far, every one that we have confirmation on was actually an explosive that could well have killed either the target or someone living at the target's home or postal workers. Mm -hmm. So uh, although, and we're gonna get into it in a second, there's all these right-wing conspiracy theories about that this of is a course, false flag. Of course it is. Um, people were trying to kill other people. Our country has been the target of multiple acts of domestic terrorism. And while the White House has put out a statement that I'll read in just a second from Sarah Huckabee Sanders, Donald Trump, the president of our nation, so far his only statements have been to retweet the vice president and say, I agree wholeheartedly. Our across the country, many different locations have been the targets of attempted acts of terrorism. And the president can barely take himself away from watching Fox News to, 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 to put out a four or five word tweet. That is what we're getting so far. Now, supposedly later on today, he is going to say something. I'm going to make a prediction and I hope that I'm wrong. I think he is going to advance his narrative of left wing violence. And he is going to find some way to do that, even though all of the targets of these attempted acts of terrorism have been Democratic politicians and members of the media that have been attacked on the right as if they are a part of the left. Well, when it's something that's as obvious as, potentially obvious as this, as to, as the means and the nature of what they're trying to do, this is when he'll sit back and be quiet and wait for some kind of caveat to come through so he can say, hey, you know what? This, again, we've already heard the false flag accusations and this is just probably a lib trying to make us look bad. So of course he's sent it to all of these, um, you know, Democratic, well-known Democratic former candidates and, and presidents and all that, right? So he's probably waiting for some kind of avenue so he can go down that road. Which is why from the beginning you can't say something like, Hey, you know what? This is despicable. We need to stop this. Hey, the people I've been riling up uh, need to stop taking me. Uh, I guess literally, and the things that I say literally you should do, um, and calling your opposition the mob and uh, dangerous yeah. and, and opposition to the country, as yeah. you talk about the media, they're the enemy of the people, all those things. So you have to take responsibility, which is something he will never do. So he's yeah. waiting for some way to push this kind of concern. Well, uh, I think he will either do that or he will simply say, violence from all yeah. sides is wrong. And by the way, they spit in Mitch McConnell's clam chowder or whatever. <laughs> he is going to attempt to both sides it, what about it, like everyone does these days. Every intellectually incapacitated person who has a platform is going to be attempting to do that here. And so don't expect any strong response against this. Thankfully, the FBI will investigate it, I'm sure. Apparently, the packages are all very similar in the way that they've been constructed. By the way, I just confirmed it was the CNN bomb that was an actual explosive device. So it was not just a lookalike or something like that. They were attempting to blow up a portion of CNN. Um, so they'll be looking into it. Apparently, they all have a return address belonging to a prominent Democratic official that NBC News is not reporting yet. Um, they're not naming that person, although I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that that person didn't send the bombs. Um, <laughs> but this is a, a wave of acts of domestic terrorism. And by the way, not just against random people. Now, yes, I agree, they want to get publicity for this, but they are targeting this, the, the targets of right-wing conspiracy theories. Absolutely. Like Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama and George Soros and fake news CNN and even Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who Donald Trump loved to talk about during the last primary. Is it any wonder that these are the people that uh, that whoever it is, whoever it turns out it was, was attempting to kill this time? And Eric Holder, after that, was coming out at that speech he was making mm -hmm. about you know when they go low, you know, and all the remember we the whole thing him. we go low we kick them right, and then. Um, there was also the CNN packaging apparently was addressed, this is what I heard is also, I didn't read this specifically, was apparently addressed to John Brennan who sometimes appears on yes. CNN. And we all remember the, the scuffle between John Brennan and the president with, the, with uh, him revoking his security clearance, his yes. former agent. Um, so it's, again, if, if, you, if you cross uh, the president, then his crazy supporters will find a way to, to somehow voice their support for him in yeah. violent ways, because that's that's the language he speaks to them. Yeah, and, and as we said, they are all already coming out, the right-wingers, the same ones who are telling you 
all of these people are dangerous, they're criminals, they should be locked up, they need to be taken out. Oh, totally not physically, I totally don't mean physically, wink, wink, they're the worst, they're the devil. Now they've been targeted and they're the same voices are coming out and providing cover for these domestic terrorists. Rush Limbaugh said, it's happening in October, there's a reason for this. Yeah, there's a reason for this because they wanted to murder Democratic politicians and members of the media. That is why they did it. Others are saying, "Oh, come on, how are they targeting multiple people at the same time? That's a good point. I can't think of any recent high profile examples of terrorists attacking multiple sites in the US on the same day. It's not a tough one. <laughs> no, and God only knows what Fox News will be saying. So far, Fox News attempts to be, they're, they're, they're taking it easy because you know they're obviously worried as well, they're members of the media. But God only knows what Laura Ingram and Tucker Carlson will be seeing, saying later on today. Our best hope is that they will just defend the domestic terrorist and say that it's probably a left winger doing this, if not actually attempting to name names. Maybe George Soros sent it to himself. He's got the money after all. That's the state of the US today. We're gonna to be tracking this during the live show. We'll see if any more of these packages have been sent. By the way, one important note is that the the San Diego Tribune, the Union Tribune, it is possible that they were the target. However, according to an employee at that particular newspaper, that same building is also the location of one of the offices. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic, or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. This is of Kamala Harris. And so it is not impossible that Kamala Harris was the actual attempted target right. of that bomb. We don't know for sure yet, we'll see as more information comes in. Okay, we are gonna take a short break. We come back and we'll be joined by a congressional candidate who's gonna break down some of the ways that voter suppression are playing out in her race after this. country in these very important midterms, the two parties seem to have very different strategies in terms of how they're running their campaigns. The Democrats want to focus on a few key issues, especially health care. And on the right, they are trying to strip every voter they can from being able to actually vote come November 6th. And we have an example of, if not intentionally, a case where certainly many people are going to find it difficult to vote in one of Alabama's congressional districts. We are joined now by the Democratic nominee in that district, Mallory Hagan. Welcome to the show. Hey, how are you? I'm good and uh, very glad to have you here. So uh, let's talk about what's going on there. Uh, your campaign has said that apparently more than 55,000 voters have uh, disappeared or been taken off of the rolls in your district alone. What's actually going on there? Well, so last week, you know, looking at the news nationally and seeing the different states that are having voter suppression issues or ID issues, um, we decided to form a voter protection committee. And that's headed by attorney Fred Gray Jr., son of attorney Fred Gray, who represented Rosa Parks. And what we wanted to do was just make sure people had a resource. And in order to do that and be fair in our in our protection of voters, we sent a freedom of information request to our Secretary of State's office. Uh, our Secretary of State is a uh, John. 
John Merrill. And what we found was that roughly 55,000 voters in Alabama's third district alone have been removed or deemed inactive. And so, um, well, we wanted to bring attention to that and allow people the opportunity to be aware that they might be inactive. And uh, what we're seeing now is that this might be a bigger issue than we initially thought. Uh, we have actually requested more information so that we can deem whether those people were taken off because they died or they committed a felony, um, or if there's some other reason that they might be removed from uh, the voter rolls. And so we're looking at a bit of an issue here in Alabama. And uh, I'd like to think that it's a non-starter, but unfortunately, John Merrill got on Twitter this past weekend and uh, tried to give me a bit of a run for my money. And unfortunately, what we're seeing is that uh, he's being very defensive. And that leads me to believe that we've got a bigger issue on our hands. Uh, certainly seems like it. There's a lot of reasons you know, looking across the country to be worried about this. Uh, so we don't know for sure exactly what has led to all or different groups amongst that 55,000 from being taken off. But um, with just a couple of weeks left in your election, how concerned are you about the possibility of whatever it is actually affecting the outcome? Well, I'm pretty concerned and I think that uh, this timeline might help. So our initial request we sent in one morning, so the morning of, uh, I think it was October 16th. And within 24 hours, we had a response from the Secretary of State's office. We were in the office, we were looking at these numbers. We got the information we requested. Our second request was more detailed, asking for the reasons, the names, uh, the neighborhoods. And we have yet to receive a response in seven days. And so what that tells me is if, uh, if our Secretary of State's office was doing what they were supposed to be doing, and all of this was uh, above board, then there should be no reason why they wouldn't be working with us in order to notify those voters in our district, make sure they know their rights, make sure that they are deemed active, and make sure that they can vote. But seven days, we've heard nothing, crickets, uh, except for you know a couple of spouting off moments on Twitter. We haven't had any response from the Secretary of State's office on our request. And so that's what leads me to believe that we might have a problem. And that's why we have our voter protection committee so that people can call into our office, figure out what their rights are and figure out how they can vote on election day. Okay, so while of course it's not in any way your responsibility or any one candidate's responsibility to deal with this, this is obviously a state problem. I am glad that you are taking it seriously and attempting to help voters who might feel like they could be disenfranchised. So thank you for that. Absolutely, and it's it's our response. It's all of our responsibility. If anybody knows another person who they know voted in the primary, voted in Doug Jones' special election, voted in the last presidential election, there are many people who I know and voted in all three of those here in the state of Alabama that have been deemed inactive. So yeah. it's up to us, all of us, to reach out to our friends. So uh, what would you like to see done, I, either at the state level or nationally? I mean, we're seeing what's happening in your district, uh, Georgia and Tennessee, uh, North Dakota. You know, they're coming in different sort of forms, I guess. But in some of these places, 10 or more percent of all of the eligible voters are being taken off of the rolls. What can we actually do? If you, if you get into Congress, if the Democrats actually have control and can do something about it, what would you like to see done to uh, deal with these uh, apparently increasing problems in various states? Well, I think there's a couple of things we can do. We can first start by electing people who take the integrity of that office seriously. We have a wonderful candidate running here in the state of Alabama. Her name is Heather Milam, and she has proposed early voting, which we don't have in this state. She has proposed automatic voter registration, which we do not have in our state. I think we can start with those very simple things. I mean, voting should not be more difficult. It is a right to every American, and I think that it's really important that we elect representatives who take that responsibility seriously. John Merrill on the internet asking me if I'm running for Congress or running for Secretary of State. And to me, I say it's hard to run for Congress if you don't know if people can actually vote for you. Mm. So I think we have to start by electing people who hold the integrity of that office very seriously. And I look forward to seeing Heather Milam do that when she's elected on November 6th. So obviously there are some significant concerns about the, the possibility of people being able to vote. Um, but we also do know that in various parts of the country, uh, some early turnout in, in states that have it is, is certainly up. People seem to be very excited. So uh, I wanna give you a chance to talk a little bit about your campaign. So as you're going around, what is getting people fired up most in terms of the issues that are driving them to want to vote? Oh gosh, people in Alabama are gravely concerned about healthcare and the forward movement of that in our state. We did not expand Medicaid. Our rural hospitals are closing. We just had one in our district closed, Jacksonville State Hospital closed down. And so what we're seeing is that people are very concerned about how we're gonna move forward as a country. And now they're even more concerned about the concept of pre-existing conditions. And so while I've been traveling around our district listening to the concerns about healthcare, the concerns about the quality of education in Alabama, the creation of jobs, 
opportunity, the culture in our state. Unfortunately, our congressman is really excited about Space Force. And so <laughs> um, I really hope that the people of Alabama's third district are paying attention to uh, what it is that we're talking about. And they're not necessarily looking at whether or not someone's a Democrat or Republican in this political climate, but whether or not that person has their best interests at heart. And that's what I have been doing since February when I announced, and that's what I will continue doing well beyond November 6th, whether I win or I don't win. Well, thank you. I'm Mallory Hagan, candidate in Alabama's third district. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, appreciate it. We're gonna take a short break and we come back. Lots more to get to, including the amazing self-owned by the White House when it comes to Medicare for all. Welcome back to the show, everyone. We have a little bit of breaking news really fast before we get into that. I realized I haven't said anything in a couple of weeks about this, but if you are listening to this in podcast form, especially if you're on iTunes, if you could take a few seconds out and rate the podcast, give it five stars, write even just a one sentence review, that would be absolutely awesome. It is virtually impossible in the modern day to have your podcast be discovered because there are so many. That is one of the few ways to make that happen. And so if you could take a few seconds out, that would be awesome. And if you tweet me a screenshot of your five star review, you, I will send you back a funny gift. That is my <laughs> promise to you, TDR viewer. Let's uh, make it clear. Is this a funny gift? No, gift. Or a gift. Just a gift. There's no T. Um, okay, so let's turn now to uh, breaking news. We now have an update on the uh, string of attempted acts of domestic terrorism. It is believed, possibly, that Debbie Wasserman Schultz was actually not an intentional target of one of the bombs. It appears that one of the packages was sent to uh, ex Attorney General Eric Holder. There was a problem with that address, so it was sent back to the return address, which was apparently Debbie Wasserman Schultz's address. It is believed at this point, although not confirmed, that the return address on all of the packages has been Debbie Wasserman Schultz. So to some extent, the fact that she had not apparently been targeted might make you feel a little bit better. But the fact that this person apparently cares so much about Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who has been virtually out of the news for well over a year at this point, that he, he or she, I guess, or they, made Debbie Wasserman Schultz the return address for all of these bombs is certainly concerning as well. I'm, I'm looking for the logic. Uh, you keep looking. <laughs> I'm not sure that you're gonna find it necessarily, but in any event, a bomb ended up going to her office. There's an actual bomb, it could have killed her or other yep. people either at that location or at the post office. So again, should be taken as seriously as anything is taken. And we will see. So let's also keep this um, very clear too, because uh, from Monday, from the Monday bomb that was sent to George Soros's house, um, George Soros doesn't check his, didn't apparently didn't check his mail or whatever. So if you're looking for uh, these particular targets to be hit, to be injured, to be killed, there's hundreds of other people that are involved. You send it to a CNN building. There's other people that handle that mail. John Brennan isn't going to pick up that mail off the street. Mm -hmm. um, Debbie Wasman Schultz isn't going to walk out and grab the package. So you're putting many other people in harm's way for just being at work. Yeah. So when we talk about how uh, terrorists, we're worried about them coming across the border, we're worried about these illegal immigrants coming over from, from Central and South America and, and Mexico and killing people inadvertently just because they're here. This is what you're doing when you're sending bombs to people, thinking they're getting to your political targets. There's people that work there. There's mm -hmm. people, that, there's mail carriers. Mm -hmm. So you're just, you're targeting Everybody yeah. like this. So or anybody. A, a, yeah, anyone. You don't know who. Um, so if you think you're taking out a voice of a, of a Democratic leader or an official or a, a media figure, you're going after other folks yeah. instead. And I want to say one other thing. Uh, in response, to, I tweeted a couple of times this morning about these attempted bombings and uh, the pattern of who had been targeted. And uh, one person on Twitter at least said, at least you didn't call them liberals like Cenk Uger did. These are neoliberal sellouts. Um, so I have this to say for you, uh, if you can't muster the common decency and humanity to care about an act of domestic terrorism, if you think only through such a specific lens that you don't care that these people were almost killed, I don't want you watching my content, I don't want you tweeting to me, I have no interest whatsoever in your patronage. Just leave me the hell out of it. <laughs> I do this show for thinking progressive humans. If you're not any of those things, then go watch some other show, honestly. I'm sure you can find some content you'll love. Anyway, with that, let's move on to something a little bit lighter. 
The White House decided that like with all Republican candidates these days, they are going to attempt to take down single payer health care. They are gonna attempt to take down Medicare for all because they are terrified that this idea is starting to get traction, starting to be more popular, not just amongst progressives, but amongst Republicans as well. And so the White House released a paper titled The Opportunity Costs of Socialism, which is just, (sighs) that's amazing. And they put out this chart, so let's put this chart up. I apologize, maybe you can split screen because that's gonna need to be up for a little bit. So seniors who waited at least four weeks to see a specialist during the past two years. So the longer your bar for your country is, that's a bad thing. So in Canada, if nearly 60% of seniors had to wait at least four weeks to see a specialist during the past two years, that would be considered a bad thing. And since all of those countries have one form or another of single payer health care, and then at the bottom, it says the United States is just 21%, then the idea is look at all these socialist countries, they're terrible at healthcare, everybody's gotta wait. Not here in the US, our seniors don't have to wait as long while they're using their Medicare, which is government run single payer healthcare. (laughs) What are you even (laughs) trying to say here? What you're apparently showing is that the very program that we progressives want to expand and make available to everyone is not only single payer like these other countries, but is a better, more effective model for it. And we want to massively fund it even more and provide access to it to more and more people. So look, it's not like they're not gonna have some sort of follow up to that, I guess. But they have no idea, I guess it's over here. This chart right here, they don't even know what it is that they're saying. They think they've got a point because some bars long, some bars short. That's all it takes. But you dummy, you don't even know what you're saying. That's all it takes, no, colorful bars. And then so people won't read the won't read the tiling, won't read the figures, won't read anything about it except for ooh, Canada long bar, mm-hmm. ooh, America short bar. It's all there is to it. So uh, outside of that also, we have a healthcare system where um, we, we've talked, we, I've always said this before, we like to brag about how awesome we are. Oh, we put money into something, we, we flood money to our military and we're the best in the world, nobody can touch us. How is it we're so whack at this? Mm-hmm. We openly admit, hey, you know, we're horrible at healthcare. We can't do anything right. Look at these other countries. I thought we don't, I thought we don't compare ourselves to other countries and talk about how they're how they're doing something and we can't do it. Hey, if they're doing it wrong, I bet who I bet who, who, who us pompous Americans can think, hey, we can do that right. Mm-hmm. Hey, other countries have guns and 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 uh and tanks and 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 start wars. We're better at them at it, aren't yeah. we? We like to brag more. about how we, we throw flood enough money at something. We can do it better because we're smarter, we're quicker, and we're the most powerful. Yeah. Why is this something that we just throw the white flag in it? I, Why I, is that the mindset? I don't understand it, especially considering the stakes. Um, but in terms of that chart where they uh, inadvertently compare our single payer health care to other countries' single payer health care, well, then a right winger might say, oh, I'm kind of worried about that. So what do I what do I go to then? Well, okay, so that's just the seniors. But what about everybody? Since everybody doesn't use Medicare, most people actually in America use private health insurance. So okay, we'll use that data, and that will make us look better than those damn socialists over in Europe. Well, it turns out when you look at that data, the the picture is I will say mixed at best, if not in the favor of some of these countries. So I'm not going to compare us to Switzerland or Netherlands or Germany that have better numbers in the chart that the White House provided. I'm going to compare us to the best case scenario for the White House here, which is Canada, which was doing the worst in the information they provided. Okay, well, when you don't just look at seniors, when you look at all Americans, 51% of Americans say they are able to get a same day appointment with a doctor when they're sick, compared to 43% of Canadians, almost as many, and 57% of Brits. So the worst case scenario has close to the same ability to get in the doctor's office on the same day. And the Brits, which also have single payer healthcare, actually find it to be easier in the opposite direction. If we could go to one other, Canada does better than the United States when it comes to access to after hour care as well. 63% of Canadians say it's easy to access after hours compare a care compared to 51% of Americans, and again, that is apparently the country that does it worst, at least according to the White House. Now, they didn't provide that information. You have to actually go looking for that information. They don't want any part of that information, but it seems like kind of relevant information, doesn't it? <laughs> Jesus you would Christ. think so. Hey, all the relevant information just goes by the wayside. Who cares yeah. about that part? Let's just say, let's nitpick and see what we want out of it to continue this false narrative. Yeah. My God, oh my God, they're they're doing everything they can to demonize socialized health, socialized medicine, socialism, Venezuela. Like they'll throw these words out. 
they are gonna get hit so hard by how much Americans want this program. It is gonna make their head spin. And it might not start spinning, stop spinning until Bernie Sanders finishes yeah, his as, second term. As more information comes out, you get, you get a chance to see what other options there are. People didn't really know. They're like, oh, America's yeah. the best of this. And well, they were told it was crazy. Yeah. But now they're being told by some people, maybe not so crazy. Okay, we're gonna take another break. When we come back, uh, the tribes in America that make up our new form of tribalism, are they as simple as we've been led to believe? We'll find out after this. If you're still hanging in there with politics, I think you acknowledge that tribalism has gone kind of out of control in this country. But what are those tribes? Are they as simple as we have been led to believe? We're very happy to welcome to the show Daniel Yudkin is gonna be joining us right now. He is the author of Hidden Tribes, a study of America's polarized landscape. He's gonna help break down what's going on a little bit. Welcome to the show, Daniel. Thanks, good to have you here. Uh, good to have you. So <laughs> the common narrative that we hear uh, is that there are liberals, conservatives, and independents or unaffiliated voters. And that's basically how it breaks down. How accurate is that as a description of the political landscape? Well, it's true, there are liberals and conservatives, of course, and that's one way of describing and thinking about the landscape. But what we did is conduct a 8,000 person survey of American voters across the United States. And what we found is that actually that the picture is a lot more complex than this sort of 50-50 narrative would have you believe. Um, and so what we did is essentially uh, ask people a variety of questions, both about their political views, and then also, also about their core beliefs, some sort of like more underlying psychological variables. For instance, what their views on, uh, what their moral values are, what their views on personal responsibility and parenting style are, these sorts of underlying questions. And on the basis of those, we then categorize people according to those particular beliefs. And what we found is that the, the picture is far more complicated than this sort of 50-50 narrative which you have, which how you believe. It's in fact, actually, we discovered seven different groups or what we call tribes in the American population, ranging all the way from progressive activists on the very most left-hand side, all the way to devoted conservatives on the right. So just out of curiosity, I mean, you have all these different groups. Uh, what is the biggest group and what is the smallest group? The biggest group here is the politically disengaged group. That comprises about 25 to 26% of the population. So these are people that are really disillusioned with the political process. They're not really engaged with what's going on. Some of them don't even know, for instance, who's vice president of the United States. These people who are just, these are people who, in the same way that, like, you know, for example, I don't necessarily follow baseball. I don't know what's going on in baseball. In the same way, these people look at that political landscape and see a game that they're not really interested in. So uh, one of the reasons I want to ask you about that is obviously here we are very interested in these this dis disaffected population. Yeah. So in what would it take to get these people interested? I know that's not the target of your research, but are these yeah. people like pretty well insulated from ever caring about what's going on, or is it is it corruption? Is it negativity? Or is it multiple things for different aspects of that group? Yeah. So. Um, one of the most important things that we found is not just that there's this group of politically disengaged, this is, this is the kind of a quarter of the population, an even larger group that we found um, is comprised of what we call the exhausted majority. And this is a group that is not necessarily disengaged. Some of them are following politics and some of them are very much engaged with what's going on. But the point about this group is that these are the people that are really, really frustrated, not just with the political system as a whole, but also with the, the polarization that they're seeing where they're seeing two sides that are just warring past each other and very much at odds with each other. These are people that are a little bit more flexible in their points of view, so they don't necessarily answer exactly the same way ideologically all the way down the line. But their voices aren't necessarily heard in the discourse because they just don't have the same level of, act, of political activity that the people on the extremes do. And now in terms of engaging these people, I think that the, the, the key here is to first of all, just make, make these people realize that there may be an opportunity for them to have, have, a, have a greater voice if there's a voice that emerges in the political landscape that doesn't necessarily alienate them as part of this sort of tribal back and forth war, but appeals to more unifying themes that, that all Americans can care about. Um, so this is the kind of the key to engaging the exhausted majority. So uh, one thing I'm interested in, and I don't know for sure if, if your research is able to speak to this, but yeah. how fluid or how uh, concrete are these groups? I mean, are people, by the time they're grown up, are they, do they already have sort of the, the moral value structure that's gonna determine which group they enter into? Or do uh, charismatic population, uh, po politicians possibly move them from cycle to cycle? 
Yeah, that's a fascinating question. Um, so we did collect some information about political change over the over the lifespan. In general, people tend to become more conservative. So maybe unsurprisingly, you get more liberals on the when they're younger, and then uh, the older groups are more conservative. Um, and the reason that people end up having these changes is is in large part um, because they had they were engaged by a charismatic leader that appeals to them. Also through other um, other stimuli like uh, reading books or uh, the internet. So, so yes, there there is a change in terms of people's moral values. It's unclear exactly how much those underlying characteristics change, but people do tend to change their po- political points of view over time in the more conservative direction. Mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, in terms of I guess the tribalism or, or how tribalism plays out in a, in a visible way, the the opposite yeah. like. The, the tension between groups, the friction between groups. Um, you, you've talked in this report about how this becomes not just a sort of, I guess, ambient cloud of beliefs and values, but an identity. Um, so it, what can we do possibly to help people see past their identity, help bring these groups together? Yeah, so no, that's a, that's an interesting point. So. Um, what we do find among these more extreme uh, uh, sides, right? You have the political activists, uh, pro- progressive activists on the left, devoted conservatives on the right. These are the people who not only, as I said, are more vocal. These are also people who derive a greater amount of sense of satisfaction and identity from their political point of view. And so, these are people. For instance, if you ask them, like, what are what are some of the characteristics that describe you best? They're the people that are more likely to say, being a liberal, being a progressive, is core to my identity. Um, whereas people in the middle are not so um, likely to identify or ha- have that sense of um, of group identity and sense of belonging from their political identity. Um, yeah. So one thing I found pretty interesting, and correct me if I'm wrong with the numbers here, but uh, these two groups on the far extreme. So you've the progressive activists, you have the uh, devoted conservatives. Uh, yeah. They're the ones who who have it as a, you know a more I guess conscious part of their identity. They talk a lot about it. They're very invested in this. They make up, I believe your numbers show 14% of the population total. Correct, correct, exactly. Yep, 8% of progressive, 8% of the population are progressive activists as we describe them, 6% are devoted conservatives. So uh, I'm not sure, I didn't go through your test, I believe that I would be one of those progressive activists, but I am interested in attempting to communicate with people from these other groups. What advice do you have in terms of how someone possibly in the media could attempt to appeal to people who fall under one of these different identity groups? So I think that the one of the key things to keep in mind is that what has happened in American politics these days is we have begun to um, view people on the other side as oftentimes as a caricature of the, of who they actually are. So you take these uh, conservative values. I'm, I'm, I'm also I, um, more on the liberal side as well. Um, I think that oftentimes what liberals tend to do is we see someone who has who's just a conservative, and we assume and they have conservative values, for instance. Um, value, for instance, if you talk about parenting style, they're more likely to tell you that a child needs to be well behaved rather than creative. Mm -hmm. They're more likely to say that people are responsible outcomes and people are responsible for their own outcomes in life instead of um, pe- people's outcomes in life being the product of situations that are beyond their control. Now, oftentimes what we do as liberals is immediately construe these sorts of views that, that conservatives have as the exact same as racism, or the exact same as victim blaming, or the exact same of, of perpetuating structural inequalities and stereotypes that have been historically perpetuated over time in America. And that's not to say that sometimes conservatives aren't doing that, because I think that they definitely are. But the point here is that we all often jump to the conclusion when someone is put, putting forward a, a more conservative um, argument that's based in these in these more underlying core beliefs and immediately assume the worst about them. And so I think that what our study suggests is that having that first step of an interaction between the different sides be one of good faith and to hear the other person out and to not necessarily assume if they're if they're talking about the notion of personal responsibility, that they're immediately wanting to blame the, the victims of structural inequality, but to listen to what that core value means and to and to engage with them on that. And then ultimately there may be other reasons to disagree with them, but I think that that very first step can be one of, of good faith. I hear you, Daniel, but uh, I don't think I can do that. No, I'm kidding. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Daniel, you can thank you very much for your work. Very interesting, and I'd love to hear about uh, it as it continues to develop. Appreciate you. Thank you. Uh, We're gonna take a short break. When we come back, the latest in our series of myths of American politics, this time about fatherhood.
Okay, so we only have a few minutes left. Uh, this is something I've been wanting to get to for a while. You have probably heard throughout your life from regular people and on the media and in TV and movies that uh, African American dads just don't stick around. And you might have heard this, in fact, not just from conservatives, from liberals as well. Well, it turns out that is just another myth of American politics. So here's the thing, there is some information out there, statistics that make it seem like that is true. And that is what a lot of this belief is based on. The fact that the CDC said back in 2013, that in nearly 72% of births to non-Hispanic black women, the mothers were unmarried. And that sort of information is used to underlie basically like everything that hypothetically the government could do to benefit this population. The answer is the dads just aren't around, the families are split up, they're not actually doing anything. Although when you actually look into the day to day interactions of African American dads with their kids, they are not just meeting other groups, they are in fact exceeding them. Now let's bring up this chart and you're gonna see examples of this. So um, the, on the left you have fathers living with their children, on the right fathers not living with their children. Now how involved is each group in these different categories? So in terms of they fed or ate meals with their children daily, by five points, black dads are actually more likely to do that than white dads and more likely than Hispanic dads. In terms of bathing their kids, again, significantly more likely. That is, they're just barely beaten out in playing with children <laughs> to white dads, but 0.5, probably margin of error, more likely to read to their children daily. Those are the ones actually living with their children. But the criticism is often is the issue is that they're just not living with their children. But you see on the right, even the black dads not living with their children are again more likely to actually do these activities, in some cases fairly more likely um, than the, the white and Hispanic dads are. So it seems like if we're gonna continually say that the problems in this community is that they're just not around, we should probably have to square that with this data. Well, it's a, it's an old uh, a talking point that's been going, um, and then you know we talked about the problems, and then they'll also say you know well the black dads are out here doing all this crime, and that's why they're in jail and all this stuff. Anytime that we talk about um, the incarceration rates and all that, like oh stop doing the crimes, but we like to ignore the other facts that are going on. I have a kid, um, a son, and it's it's weird because it's kind of given to dads in general that they don't have this energy or or interest to do things with their kid. Mm -hmm. So playing catch, we play baseball all the time. And to this day, I still get people going, I just love seeing you out here with your kid. You know what, that's what we like to see more of. Good job, dad. I was like, I, I can't say thank you for your congratulations for me giving a damn about yeah. my kid, right? Mm -hmm. And you know who it comes from a lot, a lot of times? No. Black folks, really? because yeah, we buy into it. We buy. We're part of the society. We buy into. The, we buy into the crime thing. We buy into the the black dads on in the household thing, because there's some anecdotal information. And sometimes we'll see, oh man, that's such a deadbeat dad right there. Mm -hmm. And then we think that's everybody. Yeah. Guess how many? There's deadbeat dads of every race, because that's what. There's some guys that just don't have it, or some guys who work too much. There's guys. There's dads who make a lot of money. And then they're uh, traveling all the time. They're they're doing all these things, and maybe they're still married. Maybe they have a house on the East Coast, and they have a home on the West Coast, but their kid lives there. Um, they're not in the house. Yeah, they're making six figures, but they're not in the house. And then sometimes I knew those kids. I went to a, a, a private college, and they're mm -hmm. like, "Yeah, I never knew my dad growing up, but I have a lot of money." That happens a lot. Yeah, that's part of it. Yeah, and by the way, this idea that uh, if you're not married, then you're not around. Yeah, that's. Like what decade is that sort of stance coming from? Lots of people live together and aren't actually married. That is a very, very common thing. I am living in exactly that sort of sin right now, actually. <laughs> okay, uh, with the, just a few minutes remaining, I do wanna jump to one more thing though. Consider that myth busted, by the way. You now go out and spread the accurate information. Um, Andrew Gillum is running against Ron DeSantis in Florida. If you are a regular Florida resident living down there, what sort of political advertising are you hearing? Well, thanks to white supremacists, here is one ad that you might have heard. Well, hello there. I is the Negro Andrew Gillum, and I'll be asking you to make me governor of this here state of Florida. My steam pony, who doesn't call me monkey, is doing a lot of hollering about how expensive my plans for health care be. But he be thinking of a white man's medicine, which is very expensive because it uses science and whatnot. But the medicine, my African race, be very affordable. 
always put the chicken piece under your pillow during the full moon don't cost hardly nothing at all. So I was promised that you make me hand you guilt to govern all every people's what we ailing will get all the chicken piece they need. As to the claim by my esteemed opponent that I don't like the Jews, nothing be further from the truth. It was the Jews who owned the slave trade what them brought us Negroes to America to begin with. And they the ones that been putting Negroes. So that sort of BS, it goes on, uh, is now being played in robocalls to Florida voters. Uh, thanks to the, the power of white supremacists and the funding that they have, these sorts of ads are targeting Andrew Gillum. Other ads very similar have run in a number of other states as well. As with most things with uh, with idiot racist, is it'll probably backfire because the, no one, no one, well, people who this would appeal to are already in that feeling, right? They're already mm-hmm. they're already Not in that form. mindset. They already think this. This is what they think of Andrew Gillum. So there's no one who's going, hmm, wonder who I should vote for, and then hear this ad and go, oh, Andrew Gillum is that like caricature that I heard on this stupid ass robocall. Yeah. So um, it, it's it's there just to rile people up to energize that racist base, and you know what? It's it's gonna it's gonna. Con- I love that people expose themselves. Mm-hmm. Keep exposing yourselves. Keep letting us who you are, so we can look at you and, and continue to degrade you. I agree. Uh, I will say this as I have said before: uh, the, one of the greatest things we have going against white supremacists in, the, in this country are that white supremacists tend to be the stupidest people on the planet. <laughs> Thank God. Okay, thank you, JR, for joining us. Great to have you on uh, every Wednesday. JR rated up in uh, TDR. And uh, thank you for watching. If you haven't already rated the podcast, please go do that. We'll see you tomorrow morning with much, much more. Thank you for listening to the Damage Report podcast, the show covering the true threats facing our country and what you can actually do about them. You can support this free podcast by leaving us a review and giving us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you happen to be listening to it. Every review helps more people discover the show at no cost to you. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Darola. I'll see you soon.